discuss overtly the diagnosis, um, the, the most likely diagnosis. But in order, in this instance, uh, the unusual circumstance here of con being concerned about malingering, uh, I felt it prudent not to disclose the information as it might compromise what we found subsequently. So um, on the Saturday morning, um, I um, arrived at work. Uh, this was Saturday 11 November. I hope I got the dates right. Um, I, as, as is custom, I made myself a good cup of coffee and then I sat down and I went, I trawled through the 24-hour EEG recording. And uh, the idea here is to um, look for two things. One are, um, as I described earlier, the highly specific abnormalities that indicate epilepsy, in other words, spikes or interictal epileptiform discharges. So you trawl through this. These things, as you will shortly see, uh, have a duration of milliseconds. Um, and um, so one has to trawl through this. And the other reason you trawl through the recording is um, quite commonly people have seizures that they and sometimes even the nurses don't spot. And I spot them on the video EEG recordings. We're there, yes. Um, could you just take us through and explain what, what, what are you looking at? Well, so you'll see the, the recording there under EEG numbers, the A, so it's the first 24-hour period, running from uh, Friday afternoon to uh, Saturday morning. And um, a lot of it is the... Uh, I, I, I don't really particularly want to bore you with all the detail. Um, suffice to say that you'll see there under spikes, there are there is mention of... To quote from the report, bursts of frontally predominant, generalized, approximately 3 hertz spike and wave. So um, you'll see there, um, and I mentioned the specific uh, time of day that they occurred, because we running this recording 24 hours a day, and we can do this thing uh, by the second, as it were, or by the millisecond even, uh, you, um, you, can, you can precisely uh, indicate when the abnormalities occur. And uh, so um, we're going to show you in a moment on the screen the first of these abnormalities, which appeared at 14, 19, 23. Um, and um, maybe at this moment, at this point, we should, we should indicate uh, and demonstrate the, the abnormality that was found. So, um, so again, so you saw the earlier EEG. So this, again, just to remind you, is a 10 seconds. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I think you've uh, inadvertently advanced the, the slides. Yes. Um, so you, you'll see that, so this, is, this, is, this page represents 10 seconds of his 24-hour recording. Uh, his name should appear in the top left. I can't see it from here. Um, the, the time of, at the start of this page should appear somewhere here near the top. I can't see it again. Um, actually, I should be able to see it on the page, but you'll see there um, the, um, just below the date, 10th of the 11th, 2017, you'll see the time there. So the page starts at 10, 19, uh, sorry, 14, 19, 21. And you'll see that uh, approximately three or four seconds into the recording, there is this abnormality, which you will see looks markedly different from the rest of the recording. And this wave here is called a spike and wave discharge. So the spike refers to the very sharp component that I'm indicating here with a mouse. And the slow wave refers to the aftercoming uh, discharge, which is slower in frequency. Hence, spike, which is very sharp, and slow wave is very slow. So that's the first point. The second point about it is, so this abnormality, uh, when, when I saw the first of these with 
cup of coffee in my right hand on the Saturday morning, I knew at that moment that he had epilepsy. Right. Um, and um, I was at that moment very confident then that he had epilepsy and uh, from there onwards um, the um, attempt was then to find more of these and of course you know, just to make absolutely sure in your own mind um, and there were other abnormalities that were found. Um, but the second, the other point about this, this discharge is that you'll see it appears throughout most of the leads here and there's a, um, from the, the, the top row, the top four channels here are in black and then the uh, channels <coughs> nine to, um, sorry, I beg your pardon, yeah, nine to um, nine, 10, 11 and 12 are, all, are also in black and those are from the right side of his brain and the ones in blue are over the left side of his brain. And you'll see that these abnormalities, as is very typical of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, are maximal in amplitude uh, over the front parts of the brain. But they, the point being that it's generalized, so it's not starting in one place in the brain. I was about to ask you, is the fact that, that we see the spike in the blue and the black lines indicative of the fact that this is a generalized? Yes, not, and, if, not a, not a and if you look at these, if you look at the top, the top four black lines, the, the top one is at the front of the head, and the back one is at the black of, back of the head, right? So if you look on uh, page 38, you'll see that in the same thing, top, top uh, line is uh, front of the head on the right, uh, back, the fourth line is at the back of the head on the right. So this thing appears front and back of the head, appears right and left, black and blue, right and left. Yeah, so um, the, um, you'll see there that I say the presence of frontally predominant, generalized, approximately three hertz. So we can, I can take a cursor, it's not on this screen, but I can take a cursor on my computer and I can work out the duration of that um, abnormality there, that spike and wave. I can put the cursor on the start of it and the end of it, and we can quantify the duration of that discharge. And so that's what I did. And it, uh, you'll see there that the time, the, these typically work out at about 300 odd milliseconds in this condition. Um, the, so the frequency turns out to be about 3 hertz. Uh, you take 1,000 divided by 350 you, at about 3 or thereabouts. Um, and so these discharges are approximately 3 hertz, frontally predominant, generalized, spike and wave discharges. And importantly, the, the brain waves when he's not having these are normal, which means that um, the neurons actually have normal function, normal capacity when they, these discharges are not there. So uh, people who have brain problems, other brain problems like uh, severe metabolic disease in the brain or whatever, their, their brain waves are not normal. Okay? The yeah, so um, given the, the previous history, so, so now don't forget that in terms of a pretest probabilities, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy has now become elevated in probability. You then do a diagnostic test, which in itself is highly predictive, right? And the test is positive. So in the context of the history that I'd obtained, uh, and uh, the history of two major, uh, and as it turns out, three major seizures, a diagnosis of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is highly likely. Right. Um, you might ask me why I use the term highly likely, not certain. Well, in my own mind, I was certain. But in medicine, um, the, uh, the, the, the notion in evidence-based medicine is as follows. Um, nothing in life is certain, um, not even death or taxes. Um, as we know in this country, um, uh, if you, and as you probably read on the internet, once in a while someone will be diagnosed as being brain dead or dead, and then there'll be some, they'll move in the mortuary, right? So you can be that person, when you say to someone they are dead, well, you should actually technically say it's highly likely you're dead, right? And uh, I guess um, I'm not an expert on tax, but uh, maybe the certainty about taxes is not certain either. 
Um, so, so, so hence the, the, the terminology. I just need to explain the terminology. Uh, so I then, having um, worked my way through the, the 24-hour recording, I then went and did my ward round, and uh, amongst uh, a number of many other patients, I saw him. Um, I asked him to describe, again, to describe, without disclosing any information, I again asked him to describe the jerks in his own words, and um, he said, to quote him on the, uh, his, his words, on a Saturday morning where my whole body gives just one shake. Um, asked about the frequency, he said that these uh, happened or occurred at a maximum frequency of about five per day, and he's often free of these for three days or sometimes five days. So this is what we call clustering, and it's very, very characteristic of seizures. You get little clusters, and then nothing happens for a while, and then it clusters. Um, and uh, as you see there, I mentioned that uh, he said that sometimes he didn't have any for, um, for a week. The, um, I, then, I then asked him um, whether he'd ever fallen in any of these. So if you get myoclonus, this jerk in your legs, very occasionally this jerk can propel you off your feet. So um, he denied that this had ever happened. And then I asked him whether he'd ever um, involuntarily dropped objects, uh, and he denied this. So again, with myoclonus, uh, if you get it and you're holding a cup of coffee, the cup can suddenly fly out of your hand, um, uh, etc. Um, I then repeated the questions about the possibility of brief staring episodes, which um, sometimes occur with the major seizures and the myoclonic seizures in this form of epilepsy called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So in this condition, you always have myoclonus, you very often have the major seizures, the grand mal or the tonic-clonic seizures, and you quite often have brief staring episodes called absences. So the three types can occur, quite often co-occur in the same individual at different times. So, and he, he denied that he'd had any of these. So with, with that in mind, um, and without discussing the EG findings and the significance of the history, I then asked him about, so the next question in my mind was, what about the so-called blackout on the night of the murder of his family? So I then um, asked him um, about the sequence of events um, uh, that had occurred on that particular night. Um, and, and my particular focus, um, given my um, field of expertise, was around the period in which he lost his memory. Um, and I should disclose that given the pressures of time of other patients in the, in the ward, and the pressures of time of working on a weekend and reading uh, uh, EEGs, um, I, I make, must make it abundantly clear that I did not spend a lot of time discussing events that preceded his loss of memory uh, in this, uh, on, the, on the night in question. So he stated, um, he told me that after the intruder um, had left the house, um, he, he walked up the stairs in the house and he remembers uh, ascending the first set of stairs, so he was going upwards, um, with his cell phone in his hand, and he was Googling to find the number of the emergency services. He remembers turning to the right on the landing and going up a few more stairs uh, while holding the, the, the uh, cell phone in his hand. And he then looked up from his cell phone and um, he saw his sister Marley. He remembers seeing his sister Marley lying at the top of the stairs. And he spontaneously said to me um, that she, he remembers seeing her moving her right arm and leg and that there was quite a bit of blood, uh, um, to quote him, quite a bit of blood on her head. When, uh, when I asked him about this, he um, specifically, I, I, I was, in, in order to deal with a question about um, in my own mind, the question about the remote possibility that someone had hit him on the head, I specifically asked him, did anybody follow you up the stairs? Did you hear anyone following you up the stairs? 
or did anybody come down the stairs towards you? And he, he emphatically said uh, no. Um, he then, having looked up from his cell phone and seen his sister lying at the top of the stairs, he then, without any warning, without any symptomatology, abruptly lost his memory. So he was amnestic from that moment on. Um, and he furthermore said that um, uh, it was dark outside before he lost his memory. He then, as you'll see in paragraph 20, he remembers <clears throat> waking up on the stairs. He was, he, he was lying face down on the same set of stairs. Um, and he says with, with the head higher than the feet. And he says that um, initially I was very disorientated. Um, his head was further up the stairs than his feet. Uh, I just said that, sorry. Um, and he was uncertain about how long he'd been lying there. But he did notice... Um, a while later that it was light outside. So clearly a substantial amount of time had passed from his last memory prior to him becoming, losing his memory to the period when he regained his memory. I then asked him whether he had la um, lacerated his tongue. He denied this. I asked him whether he was aware of any aching of his muscles and he denied this. Um, I then asked him whether he was aware of having wet himself and he said no. And then probably, and uh, this is um, subject to the vagaries of uh, inaccuracies of memory, um, but my estimate is a number of seconds later, perhaps 15 seconds later, almost as an afterthought, he said that he, he was told by the police that there was some urine in his pants that he was wearing. Um, and it subsequently, um, trans uh, subsequently learnt, uh, not from him, but from the records that uh, the, the clothing was removed from him. He says that after he, as he put it, uh, after waking up, he, his cell phone was down the stairs, further down the stairs, not on the landing in which he was, uh, the set of stairs that he was lying, but below the landing, uh, down towards his right. Um, he then... Um, I didn't go into a lot of detail there at that point. He, picked up, he says he picked up his cell phone um, and, and spontaneously said that um, he was very focused on calling the emergency services, um, but I wasn't sure I was thinking clearly, to quote him. Indeed, yes, yes. I've had sight of that, yes. Can you perhaps uh, just briefly elaborate on, on, on the accused question, especially as it was sitting in the, in the, in the ambulance that you saw? Yes, I think um, I, um, my, my judgment would be that the, the appearance, the two things that, the, uh, three things that actually strike one. The first is that he has somewhat dark rings around his eyes. Um, the second is that there is a, a bruise in the left frontal region, above the left eye. Um, and the third is, um, and uh, you may beg to differ, but uh, he looks uh, considerably dulled to me. Well, that dull expression uh, in the face... Um, yeah, we can, we'll discuss that later on, but um, it's certainly strongly consistent with the many, 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 many patients that I've seen with what's called the post-ectal state. So when people uh, are recovering from a seizure, they, because their brain is not working well, and on EEG, and I'll show you some examples later on, the EEG waves are very slow, the brain is functioning poorly, so many things are affected. Is it not that this sort of case is equally consistent with the trauma? It, 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 it's, it, it, I agree in time. It's more likely that the traumatic events of the night Well, I, that, that is 
um, I think every, everyone's entitled to come to their own conclusion about that. I don't think that I'm particularly skilled in, in coming to that conclusion. I agree that, yes, indeed. But, but certainly the appearance is, all I can say, is similar to one that I've observed in many people during the post ectal period. Um, so then um, I asked him whether he'd used any other medication the preceding day, and he denied this. Uh, and the reason for this is sometimes that um, medications might bring on seizures. When I asked him about the consumption of alcohol, he reported that he'd consumed uh, between two and three glasses of wine, somewhere between uh, 1,800 hours and 2,100 hours earlier in the evening. And to quote him, he said, I shared a bottle of wine with my father. Um, he then uh, went to bed um, at, and I should add there, about uh, 2,400 hours, um, and he didn't, um, he said that he obtained absolutely no sleep that night whatsoever prior to him be losing his memory. Um, so he was up, uh, he, he uh, s disclosed that he had watched videos on his laptop, as he'd done intermittently on many occasions. Uh, over the preceding few years. So, um, after taking the above history uh, on, the, on that Saturday, I then disclosed to him that I'd found evidence, evidence that he has epilepsy um, and that the jerks that he um, had um, reported in response to my questions were clinically important. Um, and I asked him that in the next 24 hours that he should... Um, push the little trigger button which puts a mark on our EG uh, in the event that he should have any of these uh, little <coughs> jerks or as he called them shivers um, and that he should do so every time this happens. So this is uh, this process that I went through with him is routine. I, 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 we have five patients being monitored every day who have seizures and uh, I, I discuss this process explicitly with them and say if you feel funny in any way, if anything minor happens, if you get a twitch, if you get a jerk, if you feel something strange, you push the trigger button at that moment. You talk to the nurses, we, verb, we can have the sound of what, what the symptomatology is, and we can correlate that symptomatology with what's happening in the brain at that moment. So, um, so I thought it important now, uh, having moved on in the diagnostic process, to try and, and this is why I kept him there longer, was to actually try and record the events themselves, the little jerks. Um, clearly, you know, if, if they were happening, if they were going to happen, they might only happen every three or five or seven days. But with a bit of luck, uh, I thought we might be able to capture some. So hence the continuation of the recording. You saw me getting on, on, on Sunday when you were wardrobes. Correct. Um, so, um, so I again, uh, on the Sunday morning, uh, uh, so it, it was, as I, as I said, it was, it was abundantly clear to me at this point uh, that he had juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which I only, as you'll see, discussed with him in detail on the Sunday. I simply mentioned on the Saturday that these jerks were important. I wanted to record them. Um, so he was, he was seen on the ward round uh, on the Sunday. Again, I, my custom is to go in and have a, have a look at the EGs first. Um, and uh, maybe we should just... Um, at this point, have a look at the, um, re the results and the um, recordings obtained in the intervening 24 hour period. Perhaps we can start, uh, Dr. Eaton, uh, go to page 33, is the second report in Zillow Triple G. Yeah, so you'll see that one's labelled. The dates are given the 11th to the 12th of November. It's the B recording, the second one, the second 24-hour period. Um, and you'll see, again, um, there were occasional frontally predominant, right hemispheric predominant, generalised spike and wave. So, essentially the same thing. The, the, the slightly higher in amplitude on the one side of the brain than the other, just like the face isn't perfectly symmetric, uh, in, in generalized epilepsy, things are sometimes mildly asymmetric. Um, and then, um, at, you'll see under, <coughs> under seizures there in the, in the report, 
um, at 11.57.24, uh, there was, um, uh, and this is how I found it, was I, f I was trawling through the recording, found a spike and wave discharge, then called up the video correlate of the discharge that I'd seen. And at the moment at which this discharge appeared on the EG, one can scroll um, through the milliseconds, um, and you'll see the, the discharge appears on this page here. Um, referring now to the record of page 41 of exhibit triple G, which indicates the date 11, 11 2017. Yes. Okay. And the, date, the time is 11 57 19 seconds. Yes, if we just go back a slide there, please. Uh, Uh, yes, that's it. So you'll see, um, th this is what I told you earlier about in the first second of the page here where my arrow is, this is all EMG, so if you swallow or you chew, you get an uh, artifact that looks like this. This is simply electrical potential from muscles. Um, and at, in the middle of the recording, uh, where my arrow is now, you'll see a discharge that is virtually identical to the one that I've just shown you. And so then at that point, seeing that discharge, I then called up the video um, because sometimes people, that represents a seizure. And maybe I could just say that, um, and you, you need to watch out for this, is um, before the video starts running, is that at absolutely synchronous with that discharge, as you'll see in a moment, his left thumb twitches. Thank you. 